this message. And you know, I, I don't know how many of you really took me seriously. All those messages that we did concerning weight, being overweight, being in shape, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be dumb or naive and just assume that everybody just really enjoyed all of that. I mean, your reaction should have been, I can't believe I didn't think of this on my own or do something about it. If your attitude was, oh, well, praise the Lord, now here's a new thing that we have to do. Just like you're following orders or something, then you're, you're missing the shock of everything. Amen. You're not trembling at God's work. I just, you can feel sometimes in people in the atmosphere just a light attitude. I don't mean that you have to be morose all the time, but it wouldn't hurt to be morose some of the time. Amen. Just Amen. like kind of sick with yourself for a couple of weeks or months. People, they'll get corrected and they're just, they're really heavy. And then the next time you see them, they're all smiles again. I just can't believe that correction does what correction is intended when a person responds that way, I just kind of be sick with myself for a couple of months. I couldn't just be all down in the dumps and the next day, praise the Lord, I got the victory now. No, you don't have the victory now. It has it registered on you. And I tried to say things as plainly as I could there, but you know, I still, when I think about that, I can't help but be angry over that whole situation. Why? Why did it take me having to say something about it? Why? That makes me angry. I don't know if you think whenever I leave a situation like that, well, I feel good. I finally got that off my chest. No, that makes me angry. Why I had to say something about it? I have to ask what's missing in people's lives. If I ever have a talk with someone, they need to be corrected about something or whatever, and then I feel like I've been successful. I don't know what you think my attitude is when I leave, but I don't just go skipping, praise the Lord, I got that taken care of. I go just saying, why, why did I have to say that to you? Why? I don't say, praise God, now I got that off my chest. It continues to smite me after I've said something. So if it does me and I'm saying something to someone else, I can't imagine how they can just be down in the dumps one day and just all smiles the next day. I've got that totally under control now. In other words, what I'm saying is I think that's probably a sign you don't have it under control. I didn't have to do the things that I have done about exercise or not eating this, but I've done it to discipline myself. Why can't everybody else do the same? My desire is to present the church as a perfect bride to Jesus Christ. Lord, maybe, you ha maybe you just think of that in spiritual areas. I think in spiritual and physical and mental. I mean, I have visions of perfect minds, perfect bodies, perfect spirits for everybody in the church. Maybe you've never had that. That's never been your thought or desire. You thought you could give the Lord a beautiful spirit and a sick body. Well, he doesn't accept that. He says, glorify me in your body. Don't be like the dualist and make divisions between all those things. You're one person. Present your whole self, your whole body, your whole spirit, your whole soul to me without blame. Perfect in the day of the Lord Jesus. Maybe some other people have some notions about wanting to present a right image to society and it's just that as an ends in itself, but that's not what I'm after at all. If you know anything about what I'm talking about is Oral Roberts University. If you know anything about Oral Roberts University, they have, and I don't know other universities like this, they have laws and codes there. So if you know what I'm talking about, physical codes. You're not fat at ORU. They'll kick you out of school if you are. People that I first learned of the Holy Spirit from were there, and they just happened to be very physically attractive already. The man or the young man and the young woman, they later ended up married. A youth pastor who came to our church for a while and a girl that I was raised with, a little bit older than myself, but in our church. But 
they, but some other people in our church who were, and these were also, you know, regular, normal-sized people, but some other people in our church who were not in shape, our Presbyterian church, and who were overweight, ended up out there, and they had to get on the ball. I mean, they, they want you to be spiritually, mentally, and physically in tune. I think that it's probably more for a public relations reasons than anything else, because it just gives such an image, an outstanding image of, you know, the only, in those days anyway, in the major today, charismatic university, or Roberts University. I've got different designs on that than public relations meanings or purposes. But to glorify God, to really glorify Him, to present the church of God, to discharge my commission, to present the church without spot, without blemish, a perfect bride to Jesus Christ. If you say, well, I've never been in a church where the pastor had expectations like that, then I would simply say to you, you've never been in a true church then. <laughs> That's the problem with that statement of yours. You've never been in a true church. Those weren't thoughts that came to my mind the day before I started preaching those messages. I've been working on that and just chomping at the bit over the years to say something about it to say something and i said something not everything like i did that night but something over the years and it was not heated it was played around with toyed with oh for a while people may i'll look after my weight for a while but it's nothing really serious to me or with all of these false notions and you can get in the right little self-help group and if you win five pounds, they'll give you so much praise, and you just think, I've, that's it for life now. I'm finally down to the right weight. But if I was your instructor, I would, I would be unrelenting without mercy on you. Because if you show mercy and hold back and relent, then you know what human nature will do. He'll stop right yeah. there. Amen. Self doesn't want to be crucified. You've got to have a good drill instructor and you need to be your own you need to the, be the best one you can and the best one needs to be yourself self-discipline self-control is better than any other form i know of other forms aren't lasting they're pseudo to be controlled by someone else so oh, don't wake me up at 6 a.m tomorrow morning saying come teach me to do calisthenics you control yourself. I just try to set the example by what I'm saying here. So what I'm saying concerning weight is I just, I still suspect that there's a light attitude toward that. That sin is not being known for what it is. It's just like, well, this is another issue or a side issue or uh, an inconsequential or non-essential one and whenever that happens, then you just have to observe only uh, for a brief period of time, and you'll find that attitude being manifested towards something else in your life. Because you can always relegate that to the shelf of non-essentials. I think everything's important. I think even raising the question, well, now, is that essential manifest a spirit of compromise? You're trying to find something you can get out of. As soon as a person asks me now, is that essential? What do you mean is it essential? Is it even one millionth being essential, then it's essential. If God said it, then do it. Amen. I'm not going to rank it with the atonement or justification. I don't get in the business of ranking things like that. That's what the scholastics want to do. If it's there, it's just all there. It's just one word called the will of God, a revelation of his mind to us. God. And I just cannot picture my Lord being out of shape or fat in the body, in the flesh. He would not have been that way. He was God. God man he had discipline in his life so you haven't heard it elsewhere so you haven't been anywhere that's worth going Amen. I'm going to stay I believe that I'm in the tradition of the prophets and apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. requiring perfection out of God's people and condemning anything short of that I'm going to stay with that Me too. chapter and verse for anything else can't be found I believe I'm in that tradition requiring perfection 
Jesus said, I have not found your works perfect before God and condemning anything short of that. Whether you're coming short in the raising of your children, and I think some of you need to be careful and watch that, or in your marriage, and we've dealt with any number of people with marriage problems. In whatever area of your life, we dare not come short. The prophets and the apostles who had the zeal of God were unrelenting in their requirements. Can you understand why they were spokesmen for God? God is unrelenting. He cannot, because of his holy nature, be satisfied with halfway allegiance or obedience. He would deny himself to do that. That's why the prophets did and were what they were and what they did. They were spokesmen for God. Spokesmen for God. They took God's word and said, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith Yahweh to God's people. They were spokesmen for him. They demanded everything and accepted nothing less. Any true minister is going to be the same way. He's going to stand in that same tradition. Anything less than that, he suspects then. Amen. He's trying to give you man's word, man's approval, and not God's word and what God will approve of. Over in the book of Numbers, just to show you an interesting passage that comes to mind now concerning the zeal of the Lord. We should have a holy zeal for truth and righteousness in every area. In Numbers chapter 25, I think that a lot of the church in the world today would never have made it in Israel. They would have been like those complaining, oh no, Moses, you kill the people of the Lord. Instead of saying it served those sinners right, they got what they deserved. Amen. Oh, Moses and Aaron, you kill the people of the Lord. They said that in number 16. When no man can cause an earthquake, the earth to open up and swallow men up. God was the one that had done that. Why couldn't they see God was behind Moses' ministry and Aaron's ministry? Or whenever poor little Achan, I mean, all he did was just steal a few things. That was theft from God. You see, when God put the harem, the ban, the curse on a city like he did Jericho, that was to be holiness to the Lord, first fruits to God. The first thing they took as they went into the promised land, God said, nothing can be yours. He was going to give them plenty of things in the future, cities that they didn't build and vineyards that they didn't plant. But he said, in the first city, it's all mine. Nothing is yours. And I'm sure we've had some misty-eyed Christian read over that and think, poor Achan, all he did was steal a little wedge of gold and a bunch of rags that the Babylonians made. Poor Achan, poor Achan, those were God's Babylonian garments. That was God's gold that he stole. That didn't belong to a man. That was God's. The church has never been taught to read Scripture with their eyes open. That was theft from God Almighty. That wasn't stealing from your neighbor. That city belonged to God. Everything in Jericho was God's. When you steal from God, he'll execute you. And he did, Achan. Achan and his family, his wife, his sons, his daughters, all of his goods, all of his livestock, all of his cattle, his tent, all his dwelling places, they burned them with fire, stoned them and burned them with fire. We're not told all of this, but I'm sure there was an Israelite or two that was in the background thinking, oh my, here goes this follower of Moses again. Look what Josh, killing a poor man and, his, and the children didn't do anything. My, can't you have pity and mercy? I'm sure there were a few Israelites around doing that. And I'm sure they met their death in one of those future battles there too. Because you can't hide sin from God. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil, the writer of Proverbs say. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. I'm sure they fell in battle. And I bet a neighbor of theirs who was a righteous Jew who didn't know what he had done wrong probably was confused. Well, I wonder why he died. He's one of God's people. And I think of that sometimes in my own life. I just, I just never have to wonder about anyone that doesn't get blessed or things don't work out for them. When, it, when I can't see anything wrong in their life, God knows the heart. 
He knows everything going on behind the scenes. Maybe there's a reason why things aren't working for them that I don't know and I can't explain. People are always trying to put you on the carpet why they didn't get healed or why we aren't blessed. And I just refuse to, I just say the promises of God will work if you'll meet the conditions. Amen. They just will. I don't know if it's today or next week or next year. They'll, they will work if you'll meet the conditions. Hallelujah. And you know, invariably you find out that old person's been doubting or sinning. That's why it didn't work for them. They didn't tell you about it and you didn't know about it. You remember that. You don't have to, you don't have to um, defend someone or wonder or worry about the faithfulness of God. I know God's faithful. He will reward the elect. He will reward the obedient. And he won't reward other people. Now, he may not reward you yesterday like we all want, but he will reward. That's the word of God to us. Numbers 25. Here's another. Well, I just told you those others thinking about them, but here's one we can read about. One little short episode in Numbers 25, beginning with verse 6, of another one of God's ministers who was filled with zeal. And I'm sure there were a couple of murmurs beside. Well, now, what's he after everybody else's dirty linen for? We're all sinners saved by grace, and who's he to point the finger, or literally the spear, at someone else? I'm sure there was a murmuring Jew somewhere around. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman. And look at this. He had the audacity to do it in the sight of Moses and all the congregation of the children of Israel. We just had read in the earlier verses here that, if you look up in verse 1, that they had been seduced by some of the foreign women around them because of that old false prophet that we've seen earlier here in the book of Numbers who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I mean, they were weeping over their sins. People began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, the end of verse 1. And so as though nothing is going on, I mean, here's a person who's treating sin very lightly, in a frivolous manner. He, I mean, in an extremely light manner by bringing a foreign woman that was forbidden them right in the face in front of everyone. But look what Phineas did. Would you have done this? I mean, ask yourself, would you have done this? Are you an executor of God's justice and his righteousness on the earth? Or do you excuse other people's sins? When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, I'm sure many people saw it, friends. Only one man did something about it. He rose up from among the congregation. I'm sure he was filled with anger and wrath at the audacity of this sinner fellow Israelite, we're told one of the children of Israel did it and took a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent. Now we know what they're going to be doing inside that tent, this Israelite and Midianitish woman. That doesn't stop Phineas. He went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Would you have done that? He took it upon himself. He couldn't believe that someone was going to sin with such audacity before God. He said, we'll take care of this right now. He, in other words, he had a zeal for God's people that if sin keeps coming into the midst of God's people, it's going to leaven the whole camp of Israel. Phineas said, I'll take care of that. I'll get this sin out of the camp of Israel. And look at the end of the verse. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Phineas is the one who stopped it for, because of his zeal. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Not Moabites or Midianites, Israelites. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. God speaking to Moses. While he was zealous for my sake among them that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, this is Moses' word now to Phinehas, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. How many times did God come down and give a covenant just to one individual? I mean, when you go back and you think of the covenants, they were like great covenants that affect the whole earth, you know, like a covenant with David or a covenant with Noah or something like that. Here's just a covenant to little old Phineas and his family and his descendants. 
That's just awesome that God came down and gave a covenant to one man. And he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. You see why I am always up here coming on strong and I wouldn't be critical of what I hear if I were you. I'd be on the side of those who are on the side of the Lord, Amen. not on the opposite side. God. Those are the only ones that are going to be rewarded. So I don't know any other way to express this to you except to say you have to get serious about sin because it is. We have to put off from us this real light, I, uh, tripping attitude, just kind of a ha-ha, now I see it or now I feel it, now I don't. Now I feel conviction, now I don't. Jesus said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn. I taught you what that meant years ago in the Sermon on the Mount. I still find myself mourning over my sin, people's sin, the church's sin at large, her rejection of the Holy Spirit, her rejection of the Word of God. It causes me to be filled with anger but to be filled with sadness at the same time. God has given such a word to his people and they are just outdoing themselves trying to explain why it won't work, why, why God won't bless them today. What a fool, what a fool. But God has made all these provisions at Calvary and, and the theologians are outdoing themselves. To, to, they're robbing themselves and their people. But you would have to be blind to steal from yourself. outdoing themselves, explaining away healing, explaining away prosperity. God has given to them, and they just are busy explaining it away. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 26, I just wanted to give you a couple of references here concerning this business of pessimism whenever the word is presented. Deuteronomy 4, really 426 and following. What's Moses' attitude? He tells the people, well, I've given you the law, all the laws of God. Moses has been faithful before the people. And he says to them, but I know, but I know, whenever you go into the promised land, you'll forsake the Lord, you'll serve other gods, God will sell you into captivity, and then he says, I just want you to remember this. I hope that when you're in tribulation, you read verses 26 and following. I don't want to take the time now. Deuteronomy 4, 26 and following. When you're in tribulation, I hope you'll remember the Lord and you'll turn back to him. How many pastors, you know, Moses was, as it were, a shepherd of the people, a pastor, leave their congregation saying, I know that all my years have been in vain that's just an awesome that is a crushing thought all my years have been in vain that's what Moses was saying and he was right there's always a faithful few but for the most part the majority forsake apostatize his successor Joshua Look in Joshua 24, verses 16 and 19. Joshua 24, 16 and 19, where he says the same thing. The people, when Joshua said, you know, choose whom you're going to serve today, the people said, we're going to serve the Lord. Famous last cry. I believe God. We're going to obey Joshua 24, 16, the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord our God is the one that brought us up. We're going to serve him. Joshua's retort, 19, you cannot serve the Lord. Notice the pessimism. This is final farewell address by Joshua to the people. Must have been a crushing load on his shoulders as well. You cannot serve the Lord. For he is an holy God, he is a jealous God, 
He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. The people said still, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. So there's no sense in arguing. Joshua could have said, No, you won't. Yes, we will. No, you won't. Yes, he will. And we'd have Joshua chapter 25 and 26 and 27 and so forth. So he just says, Well, you're witnesses to yourself. I won't be around. You will. You'll be witnesses to yourself. We'll call the stone for witness also. You're witnesses against yourself, whether your words are true or whether mine are. Ah, Old Testament, that's law. All right, let's turn over to the New Testament in Acts chapter 20, and I find an exact parallel in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 29 and following that the Apostle Paul gave to the early Christian church. Paul said, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And look at verse 30. You see, that would be deception from without. Verse 30, deception from within. Apostasy, in other words. Also of your own selves. See, Moses and Joshua didn't just predict that other people would come in and somehow influence the people and they'd fall away so that the, the emphasis is on other people, but you'll just do it on your own and of your own accord, of your own selves. Now, what if you would have been, verse uh, 17, he called the elders from the church at Ephesus one of those elders, and Paul looked at you and said, of your own selves. You know, you'd feel like the Twelve at the Last Supper. Is it I? Is it I? Jesus said that to them. The twelve at the Last Supper. One of you, of your own selves. I think we could find that theme anywhere we want to go. Old or New Testament. One of you will betray me. Is it I? Is it I? They were afraid. They didn't know which one. I had to think, what if I was an elder, a pastor, Paul was addressing me along with 15 others from the Church of Vermont. And he says, of your own selves, of your own selves will heretics arise. Pessimism. That people are lulled into sleep, that they take sin lightly. Ministers included. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. It's been more than three for me. We'll be up to our first decade before too much longer. Decade, 10 years. of Week after week, month after month, year after year. Are we heeding that call? And then in conclusion tonight, let me address one specific area that I have already addressed before that I have almost kind of made a habit. I know I did last year in looking at screw tape letters of frequently coming back to that subject because I thought and I still think that is a dangerous area and that people have a light attitude toward it. And because of some things I've learned recently in the church that I don't think need to be said publicly, but I would also say that whatever you hear concerning anybody is generally, this is kind of a rule of thumb pastors can follow, is generally the tip of the iceberg. It's generally the tip of the iceberg of what could be found out out there. And whenever I discuss this matter and taught on this topic, oh, several times in the last few years, I just had a lot of nice stares back at me. No one raised their hand to volunteer. Well, you're exactly right in what you're saying. A few people did privately. But just because I have a lot of stares, well, that's right, that's right doesn't mean I don't think that we still have a problem. 
that there's a potential for a problem. Some people don't even address the issue. It's not addressed in church. I have enough wisdom to know it must be addressed. It is so important in this cesspool day and age in which we live. And that concerns sexual sins. We have not been unblemished in our church. In that area, one of the most horrible, offensive sins that the church of Jesus Christ can ever labor beneath is the reproach of sexual sin among her members. Have I not frequently talked about that to you? I have been very plain with you. I've been very plain about sexual sins. I've been very plain about women's dress and lust. I've been very plain about that. I didn't hint around about it. I said very specific, definite things. Because we are living in a cesspool today. Amen. I mean a garbage dump. And we are fools. I felt it right then, thinking, just thinking about the topic, your stomach falls out. Someone said to me, concerning sexual sin, you know, I think that is such a dangerous area that I don't trust anybody in our church, or I wouldn't trust anybody in our church in that area except you. There, my stomach did it again. I think, wow, what a statement. Is that true? Now, that was their perspective. Is that true? I mean, when I say, is it true? I mean, is it true that no one can be trusted? No one is trustworthy? I mean, they may have meant it as an exaggeration. However they meant it, I couldn't dispute it. I wouldn't argue against that. I wouldn't say, oh, I think everything's okay. I'd be a fool and naive to do that. Because there's such a cesspool and garbage dump all around us. That's why I don't watch television. I don't listen to the radio. I don't go swimming at the beaches where the women are. I don't want to fill my mind with that trash. People don't understand. You just you can't play around in some areas and get close to some areas. I don't have a television set. I don't watch one. I don't turn one on anywhere for any reason. I want nothing to do with the television set. I don't want to hear news. I don't want to hear sports. I don't want to hear anything. I don't listen to a radio. I'll tell you why. I don't want those songs in my mind. We have to take safeguards, whatever safeguards we can, we have to take. I don't listen to a radio. I never. I don't listen to Christian music or non-Christian music or Christian news, or non-Christian news. I want nothing to do with the media, broadcast media. It is a cesspool of filth. You say, you don't listen to any Christian? I listen to two forms of Christian music. One, the kind that comes out of my mouth, and two, the kind that comes out of your mouth. I don't want to hear anything else, because I don't know the people singing it. I don't want some old lustful person singing some song that's a, maybe a good song, and I don't want to be affected by that. Amen. I hear what I sing, and I hear what you sing. I want nothing more than that. You just have to take precautions. I don't dilly-dally around those. When you go in most stores, they've got those big racks just filled with magazines. They've got all types of fleshly magazines on there. I don't dilly-dally around those things and look around and you know, dilly-dally around those things. It is a wicked generation that we live in, friends. I'm, I'm leading up to a conclusion point here in a moment. I'm just trying to lead up to it right now. It is a wicked generation we live in. I have had women. 
I have had men in this church confess to me sexual problems, problems of lust. They ought not to be. You are opening a door somewhere or you haven't closed one somewhere or you somehow you're not dealing with certain things in your life or in your marriage. It is a sick generation out there. The men are sick and the women are sick. You know, if you, if you have any physical, if you are a man and you have any physical looks to you at all on this side of King Kong, I'm sure some woman has made a pass at you in the last few years. If you, if you look halfway better than King Kong, the women are just plain sick out there. Right. I don't come home telling my wife because I don't want to fill her mind with all that garbage. Every time I've been out in a store, you can just stop and fill up with gas somewhere. And women who are trained in this day and age to be seductresses are trying to pull their little cutesy games on you. And you just want to, it just grosses you out. They don't know if you're married or not married. They probably don't even care. They don't have any decency to them at all. They're, and you know what? They're not looking for a marriage partner. They'd be concerned whether or not you're married. They're just looking for filth. I find it an enjoyable game of mine. I love to annoy people. I can tell sometimes when I'm out and someone's trying to play a little cutesy game. Some of you men know what I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. They have ways of playing those games. You can call them a pass or a cutesy game or whatever. And whenever you just absolutely are oblivious to them and ignore them, it just drives them up the wall. And I just relish that whenever I get the opportunity. Amen. Or whenever they're playing one of those games and they get their foot in their mouth or their thumb caught in the door as they're on the way out, <laughs> shake my head and say, what a fool, what a fool. And leave, and they hear that. Oh, it infuriates them. They, they have the gutter mind. They think that every man out there wants to pick them up. There's some decent men in the world. There's some men that actually love their wives. Amen. But I think a lot of women think that every man's eyes in the world are on her. I saw a girl the other day. This was just yesterday, as a matter of fact, where I was driving. She couldn't have been over 14. I'm old enough to be her father. She doesn't know that, I'm sure. She had on a tight little blue jean skirt, slid up the front and the back. You couldn't help but notice. And her hair was all dolled up and her lips were parted. She was just walking beside the road and, and she meets eyes of drivers as they pass up. And I just enjoy looking and just shaking my head. You know, just try to give them the most utter uh, contemptuous look that you can. And it just annoys them like, I couldn't get that one. What's wrong with him? What, did I not turn the right way or do something? I get a kick out of that. I really do. See, a lot of times I'm out. Maybe I'm probably the only one in the store that has a tie on. See, that's probably one reason that I run into some problems because I'm oftentimes in a tie or a coat. And everybody else in there is some old scuzzy blue jeans. Maybe they have to work that day. That's why they look like that. So I get some opportunities, and I just enjoy them. Man, I just, I notch my guns in that area. I really enjoy that. I love just annoying the fool out of them. They, because they just assume that everybody in the world just thinks they're a knockout. And I think they're a knockout, all right. Right in the pit of hell. Amen. I mean, who would even want to touch a person like that? So scummy that you're trying to pick up someone you've never even met before. You are a river rat. Right out of the sewage pit to want to do something like that. You don't even know the person. You don't know if they're good or bad or evil or a good personality or a bad. They don't even care. I think, what a low-down brute beast you are. Now, we know about how men will try to pick up women. So you women have to deal with that. But it's the women doing it today that I can't get over. But they're little cutesy games. If I was a man, I am. If I were a woman, I'm not. But you are, some of you anyway. I'd find ways to slam that pie right in their face. Just to annoy them to no end. Just to let them know that you don't know what's going on. Hallelujah. 
I don't have any problems in that area, dear friend. Amen. You don't have to have lust problems. Right. You have them because you want them. Right. You lust because you want to lust. That's all there is to it. Well, she, no, nobody made you do it. You can close your eyes, too. That's generally the best practice. You can tell out of the corner of your eye when someone's in a bathing suit. You don't have to look that way. You can look as they used to say, right on. That means straight ahead. I saw one yesterday, the same situation. I could tell they had something on that wasn't enough. I just looked right on. But you can see out of the corner of their eye, they're looking at you. They're hoping. I mean, women are like that. They hope that men will notice them as they drive by. And it irritates them when they can tell they're too occupied to even look around the beautiful scenery. <laughs> Your mind is occupied. If you can let them know that it's intentionally occupied, it's even better then. I don't know. Maybe I just kind of get a twisted sense out of annoying people. Maybe, maybe one of those women, one of these days, somewhere along the line, will wake up, though. Yeah. Maybe if they hit four of us men in a row and got... <laughs> four broken fingers in a row. And they say, wait a minute, man, this game doesn't pay after all here. Maybe I should go back to trying to find a boyfriend, you know, the good old way, you know, looking around and meeting some people, not just trying to pick up somebody. You don't even know the fool. And I'm not a woman, so I don't know about all those problems, but I'm sure the men trying to pick up the women are just 10 times as bad as the women trying to pick up the men. You can find ways to just slam the door in their face. I found, though, this odd situation that a lot of people get turned on by that, that someone they don't know is attracted to them. But let me give you some news. They're not attracted to you as a person. They're attracted to filth is what they're attracted to. The, the same filth ain't get off anybody else in the world. That's nothing to take pride in. Well, I attracted a man today, or I attracted a woman today. You attracted a rat with the same mind you have. You should be embarrassed that anyone noticed you. What was I doing wrong today? A lot of people get a lot of comfort in that. I don't know. If it comes just to having to wear a big old plastic garbage bag around yourself, just write garbage on the outside, maggots inside, so people will just get away from you and think, just ucky, I don't want to touch. I told one sister a while ago, I guess she was asking about the clothes question. I don't remember exactly, but I think I told her something that blessed her. I said, sister, you can't be too conservative. Don't worry about that. You can't be too conservative. You just can't be too conservative. If you wanted to wear a garbage bag, I wouldn't even criticize you if it was for this reason. If everybody in the world was stumbling over themselves to look at you, just wear a trash can. Say maggots inside, maggots for sale, dead skinned rats for sale. People will stay away from you then. Oh, I think you can get by with less than that, but you understand what I mean. But it's nothing to take light or to joke about. It's a deadly evil. Turn over to the book of Proverbs with me, if you will, and then I have somewhere else I want to go. I... Still haven't reached my conclusion. Proverbs chapter 7. See, I'm not going to stand up here and be naive and think because no one has raised their hand and volunteered information on their private life that everything's A-OK -okay 100% here. Men or women. But I'd say that it should be, and you better take a lesson and learn early in life. You get burned in the long run. Amen. Once you get burned, it's a pretty permanent wound, I think. Proverbs chapter 7. Well, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it's about a man going to a harlot's or a prostitute's house. It doesn't have to be that. You can turn it around, women to men. You can take it out of a prostitute setting and put it wherever type of setting you want to have it. But Proverbs 7, 22, he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. 
I've looked at women who've done little cutesy things around me, and I've said, you don't know. This is for your life. You think it's a game. It is for your life, for your eternal life to play around in areas like this. You don't know. It's for your life. You're a fool. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children. Attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to go her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. This is a very slippery area. You never get what you think you're going to get. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Turn it around any way you want to. Just label it sexual sin is the way to hell with the chambers of death. It's the way to hell with the chambers of death, any form of sexual sin. Now, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. I do believe, and I'm going to ask for your agreement on this in this church I believe we're living in a wicked generation times have changed customs have changed distinctions and roles have been blurred lust it cannot be argued is rampant in the world today it is rampant it is a disease Amen. a social disease that's afflicting almost everyone I mean if we've had instances in our church what holds for outside of the church of the Lord? As Peter asks, if the righteous can scarcely be saved, then where does the unrighteous stand? If the righteous can scarcely be saved. We gave some teachings not long ago, very important teachings on Christian dress. The designers in faraway places are the ones who make people wear what they're wearing they design things a certain way and force the public to wear them that's exactly what happens they design a certain thing it catches on with a group of people it catches on with a large number of people it doesn't last very long that's why designers are always in and out of business up and down because that fad will come in for a while then that fad will go out it's all controlled by the designers in other words it's not controlled by the person asking themselves what do I want to wear? I don't care what everybody else is wearing. What do I want to wear? Everything's dictated by what's made. And what's made is dictated by the designers. And the designers are filthy people. Amen. They are sinners. They're not saints. Amen. Now here's the law that God handed down to Moses a long time ago. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man why and he's going to go on to say the reverse it blurs distinctions it's a sign of confused and skewed roles neither shall a man put on a woman's garment i've been in christian places where they had so-called christian plays with men wearing women's clothes thinking nothing about it at all it is perversion it's not fun we had a situation just well a few weeks ago or a month or two at the most right here in this town of a group of little boys and that's all they are wearing girl skirts to prove a point to school administration I guess that is wickedness and confusion that's not a joke that's not a prank that is a serious matter there. Why would this even be in the Bible? I mean, skirts do belong to women. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, I don't think that we've had so much of a problem of men desiring to wear women's clothes today, but I think the reverse has been true. A unisex type culture with unisex dress Now, I believe that a principle is involved in Deuteronomy 22, 5, as well as in all the following verses. The, the law of the Old Testament 
has abiding validity until heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away. There are principles that have abiding value. Everything in this chapter, everything in Deuteronomy, everything in the Old Testament, that's elementary. We should know that. Has abiding value for the Christian today. In the time of Nehemiah, certain laws were enacted in Nehemiah and Ezra's time. Certain laws were enacted that actually changed slightly some of the teaching of the Old Testament. I'm not going to get into what all of that is. I mentioned some of those before. And it was dictated by the time, the ethos in which they lived. Now, if what I have said to you at the end of our study tonight thus far is true, that sexual sin is rampant, that lust is rampant in every form, I mean every form, from dial a porn to kitty magazines or just the filth and the garbage, right down to trying to be picked up at a local store. You can be picked up before you hardly get home tonight if you stop at a store. I mean, that proves how perverted this day and age is then listen, dear friends, I think that we have all of the authority of God on our side to take necessary precautions against that. Amen. And we have tried to do that in different ways. We've talked about women's dress. We have talked about swimming in mixed company. We've talked about the obvious things. If you watch television, your mind is going to be filled with lust. If you listen to the radio, you're going to hear lustful rock and roll songs. You don't have to have a verse that tells you don't turn the radio on or don't listen, don't watch television. You have the authority of common sense and God on your side to take necessary precautions. So what I'm going to say from tonight onwardly is that we have in this church no women that wear any form of pants for any reason or calls. Women should wear dresses. Women should wear the right type of dresses. The plain, ordinary, regular Christian dress. Maybe you can find one that has that label in the back of it. Just look for plain, ordinary Christian dress. Just a plain, ordinary Christian dress. Why wear pants? Those are men's clothes. Blue jeans are men's clothes. There's no way you can get around that. It's impossible to argue your way around that. Blue jeans are, are men's clothes, not women's. It doesn't matter what style or what cut. We only, and I had to tell people, I think that some of your problems, if you have problems with things, is that you are a child of your generation. You haven't critiqued your own presuppositions. We don't have to go back that far in history and women in this country. I mean, when I say history, I don't mean the second century B.C. I mean the 20th century A.D. Women didn't wear pants. Amen. Women did not wear pants. That is a product of the age. Evangelicals, fundamentalists have fought over this. Well, who's right? Well, it's just ought to kind of be obvious. It just ought to be something that's kind of natural, a natural instinct that a Christian has. I may sound like some right out of the textbook fundamentalist or a died in the wool Puritan or whatever you want to say. Right from New England colonies many centuries ago. But pants show the curves of a woman's body. You say, well, my curves aren't that attractive. Well, curves are curves. If we're going to let you show yours, then, you know, where, then where are we going to draw the line? Now, if you're way over 150, it's all right. Under 150, no way. I think it's best just to say no. If you're a man, a husband, a father, do you want your girl raised that way? Do you want boys and eventually teenagers and eventually young men lusting after your daughter? Would you not want to level a two by eight against his skull? Amen. 
for doing that, Amen. then you've got to be careful how you raise them right now. That may sound legalistic, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have to, to take the chance of being called a legalist in this area. I, I think it's worth the risk. Amen. I'm just gonna say no pants. I don't want to hear in this church, and I'm sorry if that sounds like well now we, this is our first law in this church. We're saying this for the good of this church, for the good of everybody here. No pants, no short pants, no long pants for any occasions. Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman is not to wear that which pertains to a man. You're just going to have to find out in your life ways to do whatever you need to do. But no compromising will be accepted, though. No compromising. Now, I have reasons for saying what I'm saying, so I hope that you just trust what I'm telling you tonight. Oh, Sexual sins are a problem everywhere. Why be like a fool going to the stocks and continuing to create situations or allow situations to exist that could further problems of a sexual nature? Right. Maybe that, that'd be stupid. It's stupid to continue to play around with bombs. You think that you can handle them okay, but it's still stupid to play around with them, though. Well, we won't bring any big bombs. We'll just stay with little bombs. That's still dumb. If we can find an area where we can clamp down on it and close the door, then why not just go ahead and do it? Well, none of us are going to die. You won't die because you don't get to wear pants anymore. And I don't think a lot of you have been anyway, but I just think we need to say it from the pulpit for everybody's benefit so there's not someone doing it and someone not doing it and someone doesn't know why. The reason why is because that's going to be a requirement in this church. We're just not going to have women wearing long pants or short pants. Women need to wear dresses, some form of a dress. I think it's serious enough. I have enough reasons. I have enough scriptural reasons. I have enough reasons in my own thoughts and talks with other people in this church, my own experiences in the world, to justify it. Amen. And if, if somebody gets this tape and they hear this and they say, well, that's legalistic, well, then all I would say is that person is they're trying to find a way out. They've got a lustful heart, a carnal attitude, and they're going to put the blame on someone else. So I'm going to run that risk. I'm going to run the risk of being called a legalist that we've made a legal doctrine in the church now that we've absolutely enforced a certain type of dress. We really haven't. We just enforced a certain type that you can't wear. Not what you can wear, but however you want to say it, they are just going to rearrange it that they enforced a dress code. Then just let it be that way. Because God is our judge, not man. God is our judge. And I don't think it could ever be wrong being over scrupulous rather than being under scrupulous and i'm not convinced that what we're doing now is being over scrupulous this may just be finally meeting the requirements Amen. not doing something above what's required but just getting up to the level of requirement that women should dress like women and men should dress like men i would say in conclusion don't turn your ear away from what you've heard tonight See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12. Don't try to hide your sin. God knows that it's there. God knows that it's there.